Hello and welcome to Sex Ed, a podcast that carefully explores and shares the history of unorthodox faiths. I'm Michael Albany. And I'm Patrick Reynolds, and for our 12th episode, we'll be discussing a religious group concentrated on the island of Tana in the archipelago nation of Vanatu, about 1,200 miles east of Australia. It's a cargo cult called John Frum, named after a divine American serviceman prophesied to one day usher in a glorious new age for Tana's indigenous inhabitants. Now, before we talk about John Frum specifically, there's a bit of terminology that we need to unpack. This is, after all, our first time analyzing a religion from the South Pacific, so we'll be using some terms that we suspect some listeners may be hearing for the first time. Uh, For starters, what exactly is a cargo cult? Right, so let's break down that term first. When most people hear the word cult, an array of negative images generally comes flooding into their heads. Uh, They imagine insular, often fanatical groups commanded by charismatic, sometimes insidious leaders. People also tend to associate the word cult uh, with criminality and disaster. In the past, we've discussed new religious movements. Uh, some have characterized as cults, like Aum Shinrikyo, whose upper echelons, in fact, did engage in criminal and terrorist acts, uh, as well as Heaven's Gate, which did, in fact, end in disaster, a tragic mass suicide. However, defined more broadly, cults are simply regimes of truth which claim to provide access to further, deeper truths. So while they can travel down some dark roads, they don't always have to. In the early 20th century, indigenous inhabitants of the islands of the South Pacific uh, began to develop some regimes of truth as they came in contact with unusual cargo of the visiting American GIs. Many Pacific Islanders have never seen pieces of technology like radios or refrigerators or even things like bubble gum or Coca-Cola, so they rationalize their existence by integrating them into their own spiritual worldviews. What resulted was the formation of partly Christian, partly indigenous cargo cults. Now, we're going to be using the term cargo cult pretty sparingly throughout this podcast because uh, most quote-unquote cargo cultists wouldn't call themselves that. It's an anthropological term that dates back to about 1945 at the earliest, and it initially carried a fairly condescending connotation. While modern anthropologists have added a lot more nuance to the term, we think it's important to talk about it, mostly because if you're interested in John Frum and you want to research it more yourself, it's a term that you're definitely going to run into. One thing I want to point out, specifically the concept of cult, is is worship dedicated to a thing, too, and it implies that they're worshiping the cargo, which they're not. So even though John Frum only formally emerged in the 20th century, its roots date back pretty much to the moment of European contact. Before that, Melanesian people on Tana thought of their island as the center of the universe and practiced various custom or customs. The Melanesians embraced a social system that emphasized the importance of ancestors. They believed that ancestors could impart knowledge upon their descendants even after death, and the names of ancestors were often recycled, with children sharing ancestors' names expected to one day grow into the roles that they had held. Melanesian men consumed kava, an narcotic drink made from a local plant that they believed allowed them to communicate with their spirit world. Their cosmology included a lot of supernatural elements that certain people could access. Particularly lucky people, for example, were said to possess mana, a divine force that some great leaders were born with, and others could perhaps acquire through magic. The most common type of magic was stone magic. Many Melanesians believed that certain stones were like a brother to men and could be worked to manipulate the weather or perform other magical acts. Now, these are all general aspects of Melanesian custom, but we want to be clear that the indigenous people of Tana are not part of a single monolithic group. Even between different villages, there's a tremendous amount of diversity, with over 100 indigenous languages being spoken on the island even to this day. In spite of this diversity, though, there does tend to be a lot of overlap when it comes to social and spiritual beliefs. One of the first great challenges Melanesians faced their spiritual beliefs came on August 5th, 1774, when Captain James Cook arrived on Tana as part of his voyage on the HMS Resolution. He wrote in his journal, after leaving the island of Aramanga and the New Hebrides, and that's the name that he gave to the archipelago that's now... Vanuatu, Cook shaped course for the east end of the one island to the south, being guided by a great fire we saw upon it. Uh, Now that great fire uh, was Mount Yasur, which Cook quickly identified as, quote, a volcano which threw up vast quantities of fire and smoke and made a rumbling noise which was heard at a good distance, end quote. You want to keep this volcano in mind because it will become very important uh, to John Frum. Now, when the Melanesians encountered Cook and his crew, they weren't exactly sure what to make of them. 
Their entire lives, they believed that their island was the center of the universe, but here was walking proof that they were only a small part of a much larger world. Interestingly, European attempts to introduce Christianity to the Melanesians began very slowly. Uh, there were a few abortive missionary expeditions in the early 19th century, but most ended quickly as Melanesians firmly resisted. Uh, and this is all the more understandable when you consider how missionaries wrote about the indigenous people. One Presbyterian missionary, for example, said, quote, We found the Tanis to be painted savages, enveloped in all the superstition and wickedness of heathenism. They are exceedingly ignorant, vicious, and bigoted, and almost void of natural affection, end quote. Thus, until the late 1800s, most Europeans who turned to Tana did so for natural resources and labor. One of the most coveted natural resources on the island was sandalwood, and between 1840 and 1865, Tanis men began working for European sandalwood traders in exchange for manufactured goods. While European missionaries spoke harshly about Tana's indigenous people, they admittedly chastised sandalwood traders just as much. The sandalwood traders are, as a class, the most godless of men, whose cruelty and wickedness makes us ashamed to own them as our countrymen. By them, the poor defenseless natives are oppressed and robbed on every hand, and if they offer the slightest resistance, they are ruthlessly silenced by the musket or revolver. Nevertheless, the sandalwood trade persisted until Tana was almost stripped bare, at which point plantation owners in Australia sought out Tani's labor to harvest cotton and sugarcane. Some Melanesians went willingly, but others were kidnapped or coerced. By the 1880s, Scottish Presbyterian missionaries started colonizing Tana even more forcefully, establishing a permanent settlement and even a printing press. Their goal was to spread the Christian faith on Tana and eradicate all vestiges of indigenous religion. To do this, they established what would come to be known as Tana Law. Presbyterian missionaries set up ecclesiastical courts on the island that outlawed various castum. Uh, they considered everything from attempts to practice stone magic or narek, and that is black magic, uh, to traditional dances, polygamy, and kava drinking, dangerous and deserving of repression. To enforce their laws, missionaries recruited recent Christian converts to their own police force, uh, two of the most influential being Kalkari, who lived in a village on the east side of Tana, and Yawis, who lived on the west side. Both of these men realized that by working with the missionaries and the god they preached about who could supposedly grant eternal life, they could greatly elevate their social statuses. As leaders of the ecclesiastical police force, they sought out Melanesians publicly engaging in castum and arrested them, sometimes beating them in the process. Punishments before Presbyterian courts uh, could then be as lenient as a small fine or as harsh as a sentence to hard labor. Between 1905 and 1925, Tana Law was at the pinnacle of its power. Meanwhile, two other European powers claimed control of Tana. For decades, both the British and the French had been colonizing parts of the New Hebrides until 1906 when they finally decided to split sovereignty of the islands. They declared the New Hebrides as an Anglo-French condominium that would be jointly governed by both British and French administrators. These administrators did not always see eye to eye with the Presbyterian missionaries, but they were equally willing to repress indigenous religion if they considered it a threat to colonial rule. In 1915, Tana endured an unexpected hailstorm, which some islanders interpreted as a sign of impending end times, possibly because the fundamentalist interpretation of Christianity that the missionaries had been preaching heavily emphasized the second coming. In the hailstorm's wake, a Melanesian man came forward and proclaimed himself a prophet who asserted that the island's true god had shown him the location of a buried treasure on the island. Some gave him gifts and even built a house of worship for him, but most of his followers quickly dispersed when the promised money failed to materialize. When another man tried to assume a similar prophetic status in 1922, con condominium authorities responded quickly and sternly sentenced him to six months of hard labor. What these two examples demonstrate is that in spite of both colonial rule and Tana law, indigenous spiritual beliefs did not simply die off on Tana. Many merely practiced castum in secret, even as more Christian missionaries arrived throughout the 1920s and 30s. Beginning in the 1930s, a significant number of Seventh-day Adventists came to the island as well, while France's governmental foothold allowed for Catholic proselytizing too. Although Catholics visited Tana in much smaller numbers than either their Presbyterian or Seventh-day Adventist counterparts. 
According to a census taken of Tani's natives in 1939, the number of Presbyterian converts had grown to over 3,300, while there were about 650 Seventh-day Adventists and less than 100 Catholics. Or the census also recorded about 1,600 non-Christians, and it's hard to say how many self-described Christians sincerely held Christian beliefs. Uh, what is certain is that in the context of all this European and Christian colonialism, a new religious figure emerged on Tana, and that was John Frum. The name John Frum first appeared in written records on November 27, 1940. British district agent James Nichol heard that herds of goats were somehow disappearing from the homes of Seventh-day Adventist converts. It didn't take long for him to discover that they were being used to feed Melanesians covertly gathering near Green Point on the southwest of Tana. During these gatherings, people also drank kava as they celebrated John Frum's arrival. In early accounts, John Frum is described as being a black man dressed in a white shirt, white pants, and flip-flops who could speak English as well as several indigenous languages. He appeared in spectral form and said that the people of Tana could abandon European teachings and go back to embracing custom. Hundreds complied, leaving their homes and gardens, tossing European money into the ocean, and even killing animals that Europeans had introduced to the island. In this way, the early John Frum movement strongly resembled Tenzikhtawa's religious revival, as we discussed back in episode 5, right down to the killing of non-native animals. Now, John Frum's name had been whispered in various Melanesian circles since the late 1930s, but it was only the 1940s that European authorities began to acknowledge it as something serious, especially after May 11, 1941. On that day, only a handful of Tana's 3,300 Presbyterian converts showed up to church in clear defiance of missionary and colonial rule. Now that so many islanders clearly embraced the mysterious John Frum, how would condominium authorities react? Their first instinct was to simply label John Frum a hoax or a racket. Agent Nickel oversaw the arrest of several men who confessed to going out at night and acting as John Frum. And although he banished these men from Tana, the John Frum movement persisted, in part thanks to one of its early leaders, Jack Kohu. Now, information relating to Kohu is somewhat inconsistent. Some sources I've read say that he was a former policeman who once worked for the British. Uh, others say that he was a medicine man of sorts. Uh, according to one Tana resident, quote, he was doling out medicine, giving injections, not a Western type injection, but a scratch. Uh, there was a woman in her 30s who was doubled over in pain, couldn't straighten out. She got an injection and was cured. People used to come from all over for treatment, end quote. Whatever his profession, what's certain is that he acted as an intermediary between John Frum and his followers. Supposedly, John Frum would appear to Kohu at night, uh, which made sense in the context of Melanesian castong. Remember, Melanesians believe that ancestors could impart knowledge upon individuals even after death, and they often did so either at night as spirits or during dreams. Even after he lost use of his legs, uh, some say from polio, others a stroke, Kohu was carried from one village to another, and he continued to talk about John Frum. The mythos surrounding John Frum continued to develop as the United States military landed in the New Hebrides. On December 7, 1941, Imperial Japan launched a surprise attack on the American naval base at Pearl Harbor, leading the United States to officially enter World War II. Coming into the Pacific theater, they took positions on Allied colonies like the New Hebrides of Great Britain and France in 1942. The people of Tana watched as American servicemen carted in cameras and radios and refrigerators and electronic torches, jeeps, bulldozers, and all sorts of cargo that they had never seen before, or at least never in such quantities. For the Melanesians, productive labor carried a spiritual component. The knowledge needed to perform certain tasks or create certain objects was strongly connected to one's ancestors. If you had an ancestor who had a particular talent for using plants and leaves for medicinal purposes, for example, it was expected that you could call upon that ancestor's aid and invoke their knowledge. Melanesian observers didn't actually see American servicemen making any of their cargo, it just appeared with them. So many concluded, reasonably enough, that the Americans simply had access to a type of knowledge that they didn't, perhaps granted by John Frum. If that was the case, maybe John Frum was American as well. In fact, some suspected that his name John Frum, F-R-U-M, was short for John Frum, F-R-O-M, America. People on Tana were met with another surprise as they started working on American military bases. African American soldiers. Before World War II, all the newcomers that the Melanesians encountered had been white. Now, for the first time, they saw people who looked like them, and what's more, they had access to the same knowledge of cargo as their white counterparts. In the minds of the indigenous people, if John Frum could bless black soldiers from the United States with this precious cargo, 
there was no reason why he couldn't aid them in overcoming colonial rule. And it was this kind of thinking that condominium authorities feared most. White Islanders started to talk about how the name John Frum uh, could have other meanings besides simply John from America. One interpretation was that it was a corruption of John Brown, as in the American abolitionists who in 1859 led a raid on Harper's Ferry in an attempt to instigate a massive slave uprising. This theory that John Frum and John Brown were one and the same uh, was supported by the fact that John Frum was sometimes described as a white man. Another interpretation, though, was that the name was a corruption of John Broom, since John Frum would literally sweep white people off the island. Thus, between 1940 and 1957, the condominium attempted to repress the movement, arresting and imprisoning some of its major leaders. Despite these government efforts, John Frum endured underground. In 1957, Nakomaha, one of the movement's last imprisoned leaders, was released, formally ending the period of repression. In commemoration of this event, the movement declared February 15th a holiday where adherents would march like American soldiers in the streets, with bamboo rods over their shoulders like rifles. The most important part of the ritual, though, is the raising of an American flag, followed shortly by traditional song and dance. The significance of this holiday, known as John Frum Day in modern Vanatu, is perhaps best expressed by Isaac Wan, one of the movement's most enduring leaders. According to him, even those who had none would soon be able to raise the American flag above those of the colonial powers. The Americans had warned that it was taboo to interfere with custom, and that is the real meaning of the flags. America forbade the colonial powers to imprison men for following customs of their culture. The castum belongs to them alone. Since then, everyone has been able to see the castum is alive, the castum is life. Flag ceremony saved our castum and our culture. If there had not been this ceremony, we would have lost our castum and the government would have won. It is thanks to John Frome's promise, telling us that America would give us flags to stop the colonial powers, and Castum was revived. When all the people of Tana saw the flags flying, they understood that the condominium authorities would no longer oppose it. From that quotation, it should be fairly evident that John Frome staunchly opposes colonialism. However, the movement also faced severe criticism from Melanesian nationalists moving into the 21st century. In 1980, the New Hebrides gained independence from Great Britain and France and officially became the nation of Vanuatu. Father Walter Linney, a former Anglican priest from Pentecost Island, which is north of Tana, became its first prime minister. Uh, Linney's personal animosity towards John Frum was palpable when one pair of researchers ran into him during a trip and confessed that they were there for the February 15th festival on Tana, uh, he just groaned, looked disgusted, muttered something like, good God, and turned away toward the window, ending all further conversation. That's a quotation from those researchers. Moreover, Linney did everything in his power to marginalize John from followers politically, considering them superstitious enemies of modernity. Subsequent prime ministers, however, have come to respect John from more, characterizing the figure as something of a nationalist hero and preferring the John Broom interpretation of his name. The relatively recent acceptance of John Frum and Vanatu has certainly not been hurt by Tana's status as one of the nation's premier tourist destinations. In addition to attracting fascinated vacationers, it's also brought in scores of anthropologists and documentary filmmakers. Just a few years ago, for example, documentarian Werner Herzog traveled to the island to capture footage of Mount Yeser for Into the Inferno, a documentary we definitely recommend you check out on Netflix. As we mentioned earlier, Mount Yasser had become a pivotal facet of the John Frum movement. Prior to Vanatu's independence, its followers touted how 20,000 of John Frum's soldiers hid inside the volcano, just waiting for American forces to return. According to Isaac Wan, John Frum now uses Mount Yasser as a portal to travel back and forth between Tana and the United States. It's also the place where he and his son go to converse with John Frum, much like Kohu did before his death in 1971. Even though John Frum has endured both colonial and nationalist persecution, one thing that we need to emphasize is that much like the indigenous people of Tana themselves, John Frum is not a monolithic group. Isaac Wan leads what you might consider the orthodox branch of the religion, based in Sulphur Bay near Mount Yasser, since he can trace his ancestry back to some of the earliest John Frum leaders. 
However, it has endured several schisms in recent decades, with smaller offshoots including the Monday Monday Group, so-called because it holds its worship services on Monday as opposed to Fridays like Isaac Wands Group. Um, there's also the Prince Philip Movement, a sect prominent in a single Tani's village that attributes divinity to the Duke of Edinburgh, believing that he's either John from himself or perhaps his brother. Uh, the largest John from Splinter Group, however, emerged in 2000. After the annual February 15th festival, a man named Fred Nasse began preaching a millenarian message claiming that the new millennium would usher in a period of dramatic, even earth-shattering change. On May 2nd, his predictions seemed to come true. On that day, Tana's only lake spilled over and emptied into the ocean, flooding Sulphur Bay and leaving hundreds dislocated in the process. Consequently, Nase became known as Prophet Fred, and hundreds flocked to him for guidance. Uh, I think it's also interesting to note his group, they have their worship services on Wednesdays instead of Fridays, and all of these different days of worship are in contrast to the traditional Christian day of worship on Sunday, but also the Seventh-day Adventist day of worship, which is Saturday. Prophet Fred's theology combines elements of John Frum worship and Melanesian custom with more pronounced aspects of Christianity. Shortly after the flood, Prophet Fred urged his followers to converge on a single village that he called New Jerusalem, which would act as a new Noah's Ark during the rapidly approaching end times. However, as the end times failed to expediently arrive, Prophet Fred began referring to his Ark as a ship of unity for the people of Tana. Ironically, there's very little unity present between the existing branches of John Frum. In 2004, 400 men from Prophet Fred and Isaac Wan's denominations physically clashed, leading to dozens of injuries and lots of property damage. When asked by one journalist about Prophet Fred, Isaac Wan simply responded, He's a devil, I won't talk about him. One thing that the two groups seem to have in common, though, is a hatred of colonialism and imperialism. When the United States deployed troops to the Middle East in 2003, Prophet Fred made a bold declaration to remove every American emblem of worship from his churches, except for the American flags, vocalized support for Iraq, claiming that the Iraqis were merely trying to protect their custom. At the same time, Isaac Wan proclaimed that while America was still a friend to Tana, John Frum was currently locked in a heated battle against an evil spirit who had possessed the body of President George W. Bush. It's also interesting to note that... uh Isaac Wan's interpretation of sort of the uh, American intervention in the Middle East, he sort of considered Osama bin Laden to be a good guy in the conflict. He interpreted Osama bin Laden as someone who was basically protecting the custom of Muslims in the Middle East, so much so that he declared that John Frum had given bin Laden magic stones, similar to the types of stones that uh, Melanesian custom says present magical powers um, so that he could fight against Americans in the Middle East. So essentially, this isn't a condemnation of America as an idea, but more a condemnation of the leadership of the United States, which he interpreted as colonialist, and anything that stands against that colonialism is the better side. Uh, It adds another layer, I think, of depth and complication to to this whole movement. Yep, and this is uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Well, wait, is this my section? No. Yeah, no. This is this is interesting because it's we're definitely spotting patterns like with Nzikawa, like with uh, even uh, the Taipings to to a large extent were rejections of colonialism wrapped in a new religious movement that blended. Uh, things taken from the colonizing powers and the missionaries who came with them. And it also reminds me, um, to some extent, of of the conquest of Mesoamerica by the Spaniards, of the ways that they adapted Catholicism, of uh, the missionaries coming in with the conquistadors would occasionally be seen in some ways as a, a counterbalancing force to what the conquistadors were doing. So people were able to sort of adopt elements of Catholicism and merge them with their traditional beliefs as a as a bulwark against colonialism um, to some extent or another, various degrees in all these different cases. But yeah, this is this is an interesting sort of pattern. And I think that one of the challenging the challenging elements of crafting a history of this group is that you have very few primary sources that are generated by 
the actual people who believe in it. There's a large historiography or a large body of scholarship and literature on John Frum, but most of it is by anthropologists, particularly white anthropologists. And uh, you kind of have to move, you kind of have to wade through some of the older stuff to get to the more nuanced modern stuff. John Frum is a religion whose precepts and beliefs are mostly are mostly held orally. So this is a element of the indigenous faith that carries over to John Frum is that uh, basically all the beliefs are held orally and uh, the only way that you can really understand them is by actually interviewing people who believe in them. But even so, adherents of John Frum, uh, you kind of have to read between the lines of what they say uh, because depending on who they're talking to, who they're speaking to, they're going to give different types of information, especially Isaac Wan. I've, I've watched various interviews with him and his sort of stories kind of change uh, depending on who he is talking about and, or who he's talking to, um, which makes crafting a story a, a, a complex project, but I think an interesting one. Yeah, definitely. For, for most of what I've heard about John Frum and, and Cargo Cults was very surface level and it's very this is strange and that's about all that they go into um and the optics of it that look sort of strange if you're an outsider and don't understand what these things mean but that's true of any religion um well that's one of the reasons i think even today tana is a major tourist destination is because you have lots of tourists who are coming in and they see especially the february 15th festival where you see uh the people of the island who have red crosses painted on their chests, they're holding bamboo rifles, they're raising the American flag. For lots of tourists, this is a thing that they look at it and basically see, oh, look at this weird thing that's going on. Uh, and I think one of the major reasons I wanted to pursue getting into the history of them is to kind of move beyond that, to move beyond that sort of surface level, just this is a weird thing. So with that, I think we've come to the end of our episode on John Frum. Of course, the cargo cult continues to exist as a recognized religion on Tana to this day. Uh, and it's a fairly complex one, as we've, as we've said. And if you're interested in learning more, we'd suggest you start by looking at some of the sources that we used when writing this episode. And you can find a full list of our primary and secondary sources on sexed.com slash ep12. And while you're on our website, you may notice uh, that we've added a nifty new donate button to our homepage. Now that we've reached a dozen episodes, we want to start making Sex Ed an even better show for you. And your support would help us achieve that goal. You don't have to worry. Sex Ed will always be a free podcast. And if, you, uh, if you're not in a position to donate right now, you can help us even more just by sharing this episode on social media or telling a friend or family member about Sex Ed today. This episode of Sex Ed was researched, written, produced, and presented by Michael Albany and Patrick Reynolds, and was edited by Patrick Reynolds. Sex Ed is released under a Creative Commons, attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. It was recorded at LEADER, the lab for the education and advancement in digital research at Michigan State University. The views and opinions expressed by Sex Ed do not re necessarily represent those of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates.